So you're putting something, well, let's think, step back and think about what does the immune system do? The immune system is there to recognize foreign invaders. In the time we've had this conversation, your immune system and mine will have been looking at and making decisions about thousands and hundreds of thousands of times by the end of this conversation. Is something good or bad for us? Everything we touch, everything in the air we breathe, if you and I were to take a sip of water during our conversation, our immune system would be evaluating every mile, every tiny bit of it to see is there something in here I need to go on the defense about and start to attack. So when we have a vaccine, at the same time that science has done this incredible thing and allowed us to get a little bit of a bad thing so that in the future we won't die from it, we are exciting the immune system. So there are certain vaccines in which we have seen, um, you know, a, a, a dangerous relationship between the vaccine itself and and certain disorders, particularly the one that's... Um, that the science is really complete on is Guillain-Barre syndrome. So if anybody remembers the swine flu crisis a couple of decades ago when we were having this huge swine flu epidemic, in fact, when we started to give the, the vaccine for swine flu, we saw a lot of cases, not we, I personally was very young then, I think I was like 10 or 5, <laughs> <laughs> but when that vaccine was started, started to be given to the population, we began to see that six weeks later from that vaccine, we had a high number of people who were coming down with a condition called Guillain-Barre syndrome. I myself have had it multiple times. Now, I have not had it from a vaccine. I've had mine based on um, exposure to the stomach flu, which can, in fact, also cause Guillain-Barre syndrome. But when we introduce a foreign virus to the body, we are perking up the immune system. For some people, and we don't know who, but certainly some people who got the swine flu vaccine, there can then be a reaction where that immune system overfires, gets overexcited, and then, as I explained before, begins to develop autoantibodies because it's confused. Who am I attacking? Am I attacking the vaccine? Am I attacking the body? Where am I supposed to go and fight? And it begins to give the, the, the symptoms of the disease Guillain-Barre syndrome because the autoantibodies begin to attack the myelin sheaths, and the myelin sheaths protect our axonal nerves. If we don't have intact myelin sheaths, which work as kind of like the insulation around electrical cords to conduct information, then when our brain sends the signal, leg, walk, the leg isn't going to get that signal. And that results in the flaccid paralysis of Guillain-Barre syndrome. The major thing that I thought was relevant in the vaccination area was the thimerosal, which is part of vaccinations. And I don't want to underestimate this because mercury is in the air, in the food supply, in our environment. So the role of mercury with regard to impacting or being one of the causal instruments or triggers for autoimmune disease is what? Okay, this is very complicated. There is a genetic mercury dance, which is very complicated. And at a research university out in California at Scripps, there are some really genius guys who have been working with mercury and and, and lab animals, lab rats. And there are a vast array of different lab rats, some of whom you could give a huge exposure of mercury to, and they're going to be just fine. There are others, because of their genetic predisposition, who are not going to be fine. Um, I think in the book I likened it to if you had a bunch of rats and they had to get through a long train of boxes. Let's just pretend we have a long train of boxes. We could take the group that can get a high exposure of mercury and tell them to crawl through that long line of boxes, and they're going to make it all the way through, and they're going to be fine at the end. We could take the ones that are very susceptible to mercury through their genetic expression, and they are going to die in box one. They aren't going to be able to get all the way through. 
here's the problem. We have no idea who among us are in that genetic subset. Again, we're not rats, but we can make certain extrapolations from rats to humans. We all, we all process and methylize mercury and other toxins differently. No two people are the same. And that's what's so really disturbing about the amount of mercury in our environment from so many different sources, from eating tuna and swordfish Um, You know, thimerosal has been removed from a lot of vaccines, but it is another mercury exposure that many people had when they were young. But we have far bigger exposures in our diet and in our atmosphere. Talk about it. Mercury is coming down every day in the atmosphere. So, So who are the rats who will make it all the way through the box and it won't bother them a bit? And who are the ones through their genetic expression who are going to be very sick? And are those people who are more prone to mercury sensitivity because of their genetic expression, are they going to be the people who are sicker with autoimmune disease? I'm going to cut in here for just a moment, Donna, just to say to you that I totally get what you're saying in terms of our genetic predisposition. I get that. But there's also mounting evidence that there are really no safe levels of mercury. I'm going to get to that. Okay, good. Yeah, I totally understand that. Trust me, I'm the last person to say, pour on the mercury and 20% of us will survive. I don't know what we'll look like or how we'll evolve through evolutionary (laughs) biology. It probably wouldn't be very pretty. But what I am trying to say is that, you know, it's a little scary that we we know that some people are going to get sick and we know some people are going to be okay. We really don't know who those people are. So, you know, what do we have to do in terms of looking at mercury exposure? Well, you know, they're clipping women's hair in New York City and finding the average woman in New York City has a very high mercury load. So, so, so who's going to get sick from that and who isn't? It's important for people to understand that some of that has to do with genetic expression. And I'll tell you why that's so important, because otherwise I can tell you all day long that mercury in the atmosphere and mercury in your food is really bad for you, but you're going to turn around and you're going to say to me, but hey, Aunt Polly is fine and Uncle Jim is fine and I'm fine. So if we don't understand that mercury exposures are very different for different people, then we continue on this merry road where we have corporations that are able to say, well, if it's so bad, why isn't everyone sick? Got it. That's why the genetic expression of peace has to be the beginning of the conversation. Without it, you have too many people claiming that we don't have enough evidence. Well, the truth is there, mercury is really bad for our bodies. And we have other researchers. Let's move away from our researchers with the rats and the boxes. And let's move to another set of researchers who are actually looking at what mercury exposure does in terms of triggering autoimmune disease. And these researchers have found that indeed mercury can be a trigger in lab animals for autoimmune disease. So when we put all that together, we have a kind of complicated picture in that mercury exposure can cause autoimmune disease extrapolating to humans in humans who have a genetic predisposition for it. That's pretty big. I want to talk to you a little bit about the fact that there's 80,000 environmental toxins overtaxing our human immune system. We're living in a post-war chemical explosion, and you talk about this new plague of autogens, which you say is 80% of the 23.5 million people that suffer from autoimmune diseases. These women are having some type of mimicking of their endocrine receptors, They have something going on with estrogen in their body. I want you to talk about estrogen, what the mimicking of endocrine receptors does, what are endocrine disruptors. Can you talk about that? Now, the $64 million question has been, why do women get so many more autoimmune diseases than men? Why is that? And that research is still, frankly, outstanding. And I know some of the people working on it, and it's, it's really probably going to come down to an issue of hormones. I was just going to say, it seems obvious to me it that it's obvious, hormones. But, you know, <laughs> they're still ironing it out, but it does look as if it, it has to do with our hormones. And- 